great things coming out from him as we get to partner together and build. So just um, when you see him, don't be mean to him yet, okay? <laughs> Yeah, but uh, just pray for him. He needs a lot of deliverance, too. So <laughs> I'm joking, man. Um, he's really good looking, too, by the way. So if you have any friends, single, meet, ready to mingle, you know. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Bless him. That's what you do. You embarrass people the first day so they have no expectation of you. Zero. No, but Garrett's awesome, man. He's a man after the gospel. We have uh, great conversations about theology and the gospel. Um, he, Cabrina, and a bunch of uh, other people in San Marcos, Cabrina's here too. Garrett, um, they led a huge um, college ministry in San Marcos, Texas, and saw some amazing things. And we are leaning more towards young adults in this season too because they're here. So we're putting a lot of these resources into the campuses and reaching the people at the campuses so that we can see Christ alive in all the campuses. Amen. Amen. All right, cool. So what are we doing here? Well, welcome to the kingdom. My name is Carlos. I'm the senior leader here. And um, today we are going to be talking about what everybody's talking about. Uh, let's go to the next screen. It's called, it's called Advent. Somebody say Advent. 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 What is Advent? The coming. the coming. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I grew up in a Catholic church and Advent was a huge deal. Um, every service, four weeks before Christmas, you would light a candle, one representing faith, or hope, one love, one joy, and one peace. And you would light these candles, and it was this uh, amazing anticipation of the coming of Christ. And it's um, a season where Jesus' birth comes on um, December 25th. And isn't it just a coincidence that Jesus was born on Christmas? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you. It was better the first time, but thank you guys for laughing. We're family. You know, you laugh at jokes that you don't not like. It's okay. Um, but, yeah, so we said it's a build, big anticipation for people because um, it, it, it announces the coming of a Christ, right? And, and he's going to forgive you of sins, and people get around that. And then by January 1st, it's all about losing weight, right? So, uh, so, so, so what is Advent, and, and what does it affect in our lives? And, and it's everywhere around it. I mean, Honestly, I didn't know what to preach about this week. I was like, God, I want to get into something heavy. But I saw every other church saying, oh, we're doing an Advent service. Like, well, we'll do an Advent service too. So, uh, but I want to talk about Advent. But maybe rephrase it for you because Advent is another um, thing, the expectation of coming or the coming or the arrival um, that talks about incarnation. And for me, the biggest doctrine that we failed to see or talk about in church is incarnation. And I know it's a crazy word, but it comes from the Latin incarnate, which means in flesh, the embodiment of flesh. And what happened is that uh, humanity was in such a depraved condition because they, since the fall of man, had adopted a different lens, a different perspective of God. So they had a bad perspective of themselves. And it was just going wild, right? So uh, all throughout scripture, through the Old Testament, to the prophets, you see God's own people and humanity crying out for a savior, right? And then you get prophets, and these prophets come, and they say, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And everybody's trying to say, okay, okay. And they get little fragments to these prophetic dreams about and uh, interpretations about what it's going to look like, that he's going to be birthed in a manger, and that it, um, he's going to come. Uh, I mean, just all these prophecies about what it's going to happen. It's going to be in Bethlehem, and all these different things. And then... It turns out that God becomes incarnate, fully God, becoming fully man, and he participates in our broken humanity, but ceases to be broken, and then he's there in front of the people who have been crying out for centuries and centuries, from generation to generation, and it says that he came to his own, and they didn't receive him. And the thing is, if we cry out long enough for him without putting the pieces together, we neglect Christ. And we neglect the incarnation. And the serious part about the incarnation is this, is that God came in the flesh as, G in, as Jesus, fully God, fully man, to represent the fullness of God, but then also came in your position as humanity, in your broken state, to represent your authentic humanity. So you are in the meeting place of God. So the incarnation, the Advent season is a lot bigger than just the anticipation for Jesus to come and be born as a baby in a manger, eight pounds, six ounces, and donkeys everywhere, and three wise men. It's actually the proclamation that God's coming to rescue you from a false version of yourself, which leads to sin, which is sin. So he has to come fully God in the baby and represent fully man in his incarnation and live like, and so you can live vicariously through what he's done. So it's a lot bigger than just a Christmas day and a baby in a manger and all these different things. It's actually a living existence because how many know Christ is still alive? 
And because he's still alive, you are in him. And because you are in him, the incarnation and Advent season is always at play. Amen. So let's talk about that today. Let's talk about Advent. So let's go to the next screen. And Advent simply means this. It's the arrival or the coming, right? And, 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 we, and let's go to the next one. And the, the story starts right here in, in Luke chapter 2. We all know it, you know. And I could preach, you know, the, the birth of Jesus in the manger and the, the magi and all these different things. And they're beautiful. And we preach that. And it's actually found right here in Luke 2, the story of Jesus' birth or the Annunciation. And it says this, and there were shepherds residing in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And just when the angel stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the city of David, a Savior will be born to you. He is the anointed one, Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with an angel a great multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace to men on whom his favor rests. Well, who does his favor rest on? Well, obviously he says, all men, Right? Ooh, that's a big thing right there, right? So what we see is a narrative where these people for generations and prophets are saying that he's coming, he's coming. And then you hit this inner testimonial period of about 400 years. And in this inner testimonial period, that's a period between the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, and then uh, when uh, Matthew, or Matthew starts writing. So you have 400 years where God doesn't say anything. And because God doesn't say anything, these people, what do they do? They become more about their Jewish law. And they think the more they do more works of the law, the more, faster Jesus will come. Well, then, so they're waiting for it. They're birthing it. But they spend more time in the temples far, focusing on sacrifices and laws and rituals and all these different things that actually made Pharisees because there was no prophetic voice. And then 400 years later, God comes to announce that there's going to be a son born through a Virgin Mary. And it looks like a gender reveal party. <laughs> and that's how it happens. An angel comes after 400 years of silence, what it seemed like from the divine, and then you get this presentation that a king will be born. And not only that, the announcement along with what's going to happen is, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. So what makes this season about good news of great joy? Think about it. You're, you're a, an, an Israelite. You've had these prophetic promises. You've been through different types of exiles. You've been beaten up on the playground. In your own land, people have been demolishing your temple. They're allowing you to rebuild it. Then they knock it down again. And then you're slaves and you're dispersed. And all these prophetic things and even all the Old Testament scriptures crying out for a Savior. Where are you? Where are you? We're in oppression. You even promised Moses that you'd send a prophet to deliver us. And they have all these things in their head, in their history. They know the stories, and they're crying out for freedom. But the type of freedom they want has become a religious one instead of the one God comes to bring. And although this is a beautiful story, and God comes to rescue them from, yes, from the tyranny of religion, the tyranny of performance, the tyranny of the false lens, the Advent story does not start in Luke chapter 2. The Advent story is the unfolding of Scripture, prophesying, calling forth for the Redeemer, the anointing one himself, the one that every angel in heaven and all the glory of the host would say, glory to God in the highest and peace to his men on earth. Jesus came to bring peace between God and man. It wasn't just to give them back a city, to build them a temple so they can have better worship services. He's saying, no, the Savior is coming for all men because his favor will be on all men. And if you've been born of any type of, by, by a woman, which would probably be everybody, or it is everybody, don't get it confused. I don't care what you read about politics. Um, that is for you. And he's coming to bring peace. And why does he come to bring peace? Because man is living in this anxiety from the fall of man. This false delusion of separation. Not only is he coming to, he's not coming to, to overthrow the Romans and strike them all down and put prayer back in schools, but he's coming to show you that God has never changed his mind about you. 
And he's going to do so by God becoming incarnate himself to show you what he looks like. So it doesn't start here, though. So let's go to the next one. The, the nativity story actually starts in, what's to say this? <laughs> the story of the coming of Jesus doesn't begin in the New Testament, and it doesn't end with a baby in a manger. Let's go to the next one. It actually starts in Genesis. And it says this. This is the first time we see the Christmas story or the nativity or the anticipation or of the arrival or Advent language. And it's here in Genesis chapter 3. And this starts with the fall of man. This is where the devil tempts Adam and Eve, and they mess it up. I'm just going to read it for you, and I'm going to kind of go through this. But it says, now this serpent, context, God said, let us create man in our image, and they did it really fast, and they did. So man was already created in their image, and then in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes and lies and deceives. And we all know this story, but man, it's super important. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Lord God had made. Jehovah Elohim. And he said to the woman, did God really say? So up until this point, Genesis chapter 2, there's 24 references to God that's either used by Adam and Eve or the author. And it's Lord God. And what that means is Jehovah Elohim. Jehovah means the plurality, the trinity, the relational aspect of God. And Elohim is just like a general term for God. So he... Humanity has a point of reference. The author has a point of reference that God is not only God, but he's relational. He's familial. He's three in one. There's plurality. And the first thing the devil comes and says to them is he drops the Lord. He drops the plurality. He drops the relationality of who they knew he was and just says, forget Lord God. He's not even relational. He's isolated. He's far from you. He's not even here. Did God really say so there was a problem. They believed that they were alone. They believed that somehow God was separated from them. And because of that, the, de the, de the devil said, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did. Now she even adopts just God language, not even relational. You must eat, not eat the fruit from... You should not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. The serpent said, you will certainly, you will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The thing is, they were already like God. So the devil comes and says, hey, if you want to do something to be like God, you got to do this. And basically that what he's doing is he's trying to tell you that there's something you can do outside the grace of God to become what he already says you are. And that's called dead religion. So dead religion is in effect the, the isolation of God, not him being familial is already in effect. And when the woman saw that the, the fruit on the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and is also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open. What were they open to? They were open to an existence, a pseudo-reality. Now they had to sustain that they were never created for. It's called the fall of man. And it was plagued by religion. It was plagued by seeing God not as familial or relational. So he says, um, so the eyes were open, and they realized that they were naked, that they were in lack. So they sewed fig trees together, a little fikini <laughs> together, and made coverings for themselves. Next one. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of God, the Lord God now, right? The author. And he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called the man and said, where are you? You see, in our English translation, it's a question. Hey, where are you? But God knew where they are. He found them. He went exactly where they were in the middle of their sin. Their sin didn't change his mind. He pursued them in their sin while they were running. He knew where they were. And in our English translation, it says, where are you? But if you look in the Hebrew, it's not asking a question. It's God making a statement saying, this man I don't recognize. So God had made them in their image. They enjoyed fellowship. They called him Lord God. They embraced, they embraced the, rational, the rationality, the, the relationship part aspect of them. And the devil lied, and then they, be, they started living a lie. Their eyes were open to another type of system. They ran in shame, put false covering on themselves. And then God comes to just experience fellowship like he always had in the cool of the day. Nothing changed in his heart. And he sees two people that are so out of their natural character. 
And he says, I don't recognize this. We had a fellowship yesterday, but right now, what's going on? I don't know what happened, or I do know what happened. But this is not your natural state of living. This is not my original intent for mankind. Something has changed. So then we read on, right? And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Then man said, the woman. <laughs> the woman you put with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So he's already casting blame and everything. And then this is where you see the nativity and the Christmas story spawned into effect right here. God gets angry. And he says this, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord said to the woman, because you have done this, curse you are above all livestock and all wild animals. No, it doesn't say that. He curses the devil, not the woman, not the man. And he says this, he curses the serpent, the liar. The pseudo-reality, the one who embraced this whole turmoil of religion and separation. He says, because you have done this, curse are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike its heel. So I'd like to tell you that the nativity story began when the Annunciation and Gabriel came and said, oh, the baby Jesus is going to be born. But it didn't. It started in Genesis chapter 3. And ever since Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to take you through a little narrative of how it's been unfolding the advent. There's never been an unadvent season. It doesn't just happen with mistletoes and Christmas trees and gifts under the, under the tree and all that stuff. It actually started a long time ago because long before there was a problem, there was already a solution. Because the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So this didn't catch God by surprise, but in this thing, he announces the incarnation, that something's going to happen to redeem all this, and that person, he's going to punish the devil. He's going to punish all of his schemes. He will crush his head and he, it, when he strikes its hill. So now we get to Advent talk. Now we get to Christmas talk. What is this thing for? What are we doing here? Are we just celebrating the baby Jesus over and over and over and over? Or is this an unfolding story where now all of the Bible narrative becomes Advent? You see what I'm saying? So let's go to the next one. So let's take you through. It says the incarnation of Jesus was the wrath of God against sin and death. Did you notice how God got mad? And he said, you devil, you lied to him. I'm not going to punish them. I'm not coming for retribution of mankind. But this is what the incarnation is going to entail, that it's going to punish you. So the wrath of God was not pointed at humanity, nor will it ever be. It's pointed at the false delusions of everything that is not you that he embedded in you and him. So the incarnation, the advent, it's a lot more serious than we think. It's the annunciation that this is all going to be redeemed. And while Jesus reconciles all to himself, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on sin. Because Jesus, God condemned sin in Jesus' flesh, not Jesus. So it's the annunciation that God can't tolerate his kids being distracted. He can't tolerate his kids believing lies, so he kills the author of lies. Said, no more, you would be under the influence of this. So it's not about Santa Claus coming through your chimney and getting stuck and eating your cookies. <laughs> it's about the wrath of God against everything that tries to deceive you from what you always are. The incarnation, the Advent season, was the awaiting arrival that they miss in the scriptures that were pointing out to the real disease, sin and death, not a political issue. So the incarnation, the Advent season, is the expectation that the Savior would come and punish everything that tries to get you to believe in a false version of yourself. Oh, my gosh. Next. Too heavy already, right? I know. Next. 
Cool. So let's, let's go. Let's go through because this has been a an, an, an advent for everybody. I mean, let's start. We started in Genesis. It didn't start in Luke. It started in Genesis. And then we go uh, to Deuteronomy, right? This is Deuteronomy means the second eulogy or the second preach, the second sermon, right? And this is Moses reprefacing the sermon he did on the mount. And he says this: uh, Moses' prophecy. I will raise up. For them, a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything, everything I command him. So even Moses saying, I brought you out of captivity with God from Egypt, but man, there's a bigger captivity that we're facing, that we're buying into, and there's going to be another that's going to come that's going to set us free from a bigger type of captivity. So Moses knew it. He was preaching the advent already. Let's go to the next one. And then Isaiah, right? Isaiah says this. The people who are walking in darkness have seen a great light. On, on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. So he's prophesying. This guy's going to come and he's going to take people out of darkness. That the light of Christ himself, the light of the world is going to come and shine light on who you really are and bring you out of the false reality you think you're in. He says, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. This is supposed to be our reaction <laughs> during Advent, during Christmas, during Easter. You know, it's so hard for me to preach on Easter and Advent and seasonal things because I feel like I preach this every week. Because <laughs> the story doesn't change. I know some of you realize that I preach 40% of the same thing every week because there's no other message. The Bible testifies to this coming, to this spanking that the naughty boy, the devil needed for messing with his kids. And it's all spun into motion, and this is supposed to be what's going to happen. They're going to celebrate like they collect plunder. So guess what? That doesn't mean you're in a war. What happened is the warriors would go in and they would slay everybody and leave the plunder on the floor and then the others would come in and reap the inheritance of what they fought for. So you're not here to win a war. You're here to collect plunder based on a war that's already been won. Yes. He didn't say he was going to send you to do it. He said he sent Christ. This isn't about you. This is about him. And guess what? You're in him. And now your inheritance, right? You're a co-heir. And you don't get your inheritance when you die. You get your inheritance when somebody else dies. Okay, so this is the, the thing. It says, for as in the day meetings defeat, you have, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them from the bar across their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor. What is that religion? Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. It says this. And then here's the, the prophecy that he's going to come. Well, how is this going to happen? That's great. One day we're going to be rejoicing. That sounds great, God. Thank you, prophet. But wow. For us to a child is born. To us a sign is given. And the government will be on whose shoulders? His shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Familial. Prince of peace. Why? Because without this message, you living in a condemned state, separated from the mind of God in your mind, is what gets you anxiety. And what's the opposite of anxiety? Peace. Peace to the world. There's no more delusion. There's no more distraction. I'm ruining on that. I'm crucifying that on the cross in my incarnation. Yes, you can celebrate my birth, but man, we're moving forward to delete this. Just like you've never sinned. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no ends. Please highlight that in your Bible. Well, brother, you know, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse before God comes back. I disagree. <laughs> it says the peace and the greatness of his government, there will be no end. So it's only getting better. It may not get, be getting faster because people aren't awakened to this. But when people awaken to this, we'll start seeing what this says. Because if you believe that God's going to hell, or everybody's just going to hell in a handbasket and the world is just going crazy, well, then you know what? You're going to stand on the sidelines and your prophecy is going to be self-fulfilled that nothing's going to happen. It's just going to get worse. You are more than a conqueror because the conqueror came before you. He will reign on David's throne 
and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. Justice and righteousness, yes. The justice is that every punishment that's deserved for making you believe something bad about yourself or not true about yourself that creates distance, delay, and separation is going to be judged. And you're going to be judged too, but guess what your judgment is? Righteous. <laughs> Just like you've never sinned. In your truest state, yeah, you may have been living a lie. You may have been reaping the, har the harvest of unrighteousness. But God's going to show you that he's in seed like that through his son. And he's going to give you the Holy Spirit to convince you every day that you are righteous. And you're going to live with that face-to-face -face encounter as you behold in the mirror of what's good and what loves you. And what's actually pursuing you in love regardless of your shame and your sickness and your sin. And he's going to reconcile that till you start seeing the real you. And when you see the real you, things are going to get better. And then people are going to wake up in 10 years and be like, dude, God's really on a roll. Man, the church is really in, in control. <laughs> but the advent is just the unfolding of scripture. It doesn't happen when the angel says, okay, now we're going to have a baby. Talk about ruining purity culture. <laughs> that joke's not for everybody. Next. So Micah, right? Same, same time. The stuff's going bad with the temple, man. People are rebellious. These are called the, the minor prophets, you know. And if uh, we needed another bad prophetic word, God would just raise up minor prophets. But he doesn't want that anymore. Because now the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And if it doesn't function from what he's done, it's not a prophetic word. You are holding prophecy in contempt. So it's not about dates, mates, and babies and what you can predict. That's fine. I'm good for that. But please tie it into the incarnation and what's been won and tell me about some freedom in my life. So Micah's prophecy says this, but you, O Bethlehem. Why is that important? Because Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He's calling it out, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth from me, one who is... To be the ruler in Israel whose coming forth is from God from the ancient days. So everybody's pointing to it. Everybody's saying he's coming. He's going to relieve you. He's going to liberate you. Just like Moses said, he's going to send another prophet. But guess what? Moses is wrong. He's more than a prophet. He's Lord and prophet. He's all fivefold and all wrapped in one. And he comes to deliver his people just like Moses did. But what you see in scripture from Genesis to Deuteronomy to the prophets to even David crying out in the wilderness in his, in his poetry readings, the Psalms, is that something has to get done. Where are you? Your own people are suffering. And you're holding back? And these prophets come. And they say, you know, there's a better covenant coming. There's a better reality coming of righteousness. And the people who were so legal didn't like that, and they ended up crucifying them. <laughs> and that's why Jesus shows up on the scene in the New Testament and says, yeah, well, you crucified the prophets. <laughs> yeah, probably the same is going to happen for me. So let's go to the next one. So you see it all throughout Scripture. It's, you know, and then even in the New Testament, Paul, right, it says this. But when the set time had fully come, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. The law is a religious system. It gets you to try to participate in things that try to make you what God already sees you as. It uses if and then language. If you just did this, then you would be righteous. If you fasted, then you would be holy. No, you already are holy, so live a fasted lifestyle. You already are righteous, and you don't grow in righteousness because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your experience of it grows, yes, but the fact that whether you're having that encounter or not doesn't make it true about you. So he's coming to redeem you from those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. And adoption is Brittany so clearly preached a couple of weeks ago is not about like what we think adoption is in Western culture. It was more about a presentation, a maturity saying, dude, my son finally gets it. My daughter finally gets it. He's always been my son. He's always been my daughter. It's not like I went and adopted someone and brought him here and then they don't even have the same skin color as me and I got to call him son. He's saying, no, it's a presentation. It's a levitation, an endorsement. This is my son and who I'm well pleased. He's getting it. He's thinking it like me. He's taking my incarnation. He's noticing Advent in everything. Oh. 
Because you're his sons, God sent his spirit of his son into your hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So how do you know if you're mature is if you can receive... If you can receive God as a father, not just as a judge anymore. The maturity is, man, when you sin, you're like, God, Dad, Papa, I'm sorry, man. And he's not waiting there with a the thunderbolt waiting to strike you down like a Greek mythological, mythological God waiting to strike you down. Balancing the just ledger. Because you're bad, I got to do something bad. You know, No, he's not like that. He comes to rescue you. Why? Because his plan, like I read earlier, is to show you the riches of his grace. That's his only plan for humanity. What, what's God doing today, brother? Uh, well, he's uh, unveiling the riches of his grace and his mercy to all mankind. No, 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 no but, but tell me what he's doing in your ministry. My ministry is not worth anything, and that's not my message. Because this is what he's doing. Okay. So you're no longer a slave, but a ch God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Remember, yeah. it's by God's doing you're an heir, not your performance. Right. Next. So Paul got it right. Let's go to the mirror. I love this. I got to get some mirror in every day. Yeah. Buy, buy this translation, please. It's like $9 on your freaking laptop. And it updates for you. You, gotta, you guys are crazy. <laughs> this, this is the Galatians chapter 4 in the mirror translation. I love it. It says this. But then, remember the fullness of time, Jesus came, delivered from the law. Another translate or paraphrase. But then the, the day dawned, the most complete culmination of time. Everything predicted was concluded in Christ. The son arrived, commissioned by the father. His legal passport to the planet was his mother's womb. In a human body exactly like ours, he lived his life subject to the same scrutiny of the law. Now our true state of sonship again is realized. It was not though he arrived on a foreign planet. He came to his own, and yet his own did not recognize him. In Psalm 24, it says, But to everyone who realizes their association in him, convinced that he is their original life, in them he confirms that we are his offspring. He confirms that we are his offspring. These are they who discover their genesis in, beyond, in God beyond their natural conception. Man began in God. We are not the invention of our parents. Suddenly, the invisible eternal word takes on visible form, incarnation. The incarnation, in him, in us, the most accurate, tangible display of God's eternal thought finds expression in your human life. Your ability to agree with what God has done in the cross and the death burial cross of Jesus Christ and your co-inclusion is what's going to give magnification that he's alive in you. My gosh. He captivates our gaze. How does he do it? God captivates our gaze. That means that he's a hopeless romantic. He has a flower and he's not saying, I love you, I love you not, I love you. It's I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And it goes on for eternity. And if you choose not to believe that, you're, he's not the confused one. You are. Okay, cool. So uh, the glory we see is not a religious replica. He is the authentic monogenous, begotten only of God. In him we recognize our true beginning. The glory that Adam lost returns in fullness. Only grace can communicate truth in such a complete context. Next. Now, verse 5, his mandate was to rescue the human race from the regime of the law of performance and announce the revelation of their true sonship in God. Jesus comes as a logos, the word, the common sense, the logic to show mankind what God really thinks. When Jesus walks around and heals the sick, he's showing you the common sense of God. He's not to be convinced or get fasted up to heal somebody. When he raises the dead, he's doing the common sense of God. Well, it's just common sense. It's like if you're walking, if you're walking down the street and you see a hundred dollar bill, you don't have to think about picking it up. It's common sense. You're like, okay, I'll pick this up. Thank you, Jesus. And you put it in your pocket and you go to KFC. It's common sense. So Jesus comes as common sense on display, the logic, the logos, the common sense. To reintroduce you back to yourself. Hey, this has been you from the beginning. You were under the works of the law, trying to earn it, trying to do voodoo doo doo stuff. But now my declaration to you is that if you look at me, you'll see yourself in me and find your true humanity. Isn't this beautiful? 
The original life of the Father revealed in his Son is the life the Spirit now conducts with us. Slavery is such a poor substitute for sonship. They're opposites. The one leads forcefully through fear, and sonship responds fondly to Abba, Father. In Romans 8.15, it says his Spirit resonates within our spirit to confirm that the fact that we originate in God. So the gospel gives you back your original origin, if that makes sense. It shows you, hey, you know what? Let me show you where you've, you've always been at home. Oh, my gosh. To seal our sonship with God, to seal our sonship, God has commissioned the spirit of sonship to resonate the Abba echo in our hearts. And now in the innermost being, we recognize him as our true and very dear father. Can you see how foolish it would be? for a son to continue to live his life with a slave mentality. Your sonship qualifies you to immediately participate in all the wealth of God's inheritance, which is yours because of Christ. Amen. So why is Christ a big deal? Why is Advent season a big deal? Because it reconfirms what God's always believed about you and brings back that fellowship to ignite. Legalism in its very disguise contradicts sonship. Sonship is not for sale. Amen. Next. You guys getting the drift? It's found everywhere in scripture. I know we open it up every Christmas and read the Christmas story, and I'm good with that. I love it. I love talking about steak. <laughs> but it's been prophesied. The Advent's been unfolding. The only time you don't find the advent is in Luke 2. You find it since Genesis when man was deceived and God had a vengeance, had a wrath against everything that was caused to deceive you. So if you do want to celebrate, if you do want to talk about wrath, it's something to celebrate. I can't wait for the wrath of God to pour out on lies I believe about myself. Are you kidding me? That's the only weapon I have. I can't do that on my own. You know that God is more angry about the lies you believe about yourself than you do? The wrath of God is good news because it's pointing at everything you're not designed to be. It doesn't cost you anything. Well, brother, if I just gave up pornography, well, then, uh, blah, blah, blah. dude, I guarantee you, when you let God take that from your life, you're not going to miss it very much when he replaces it with his grace. <laughs> Paul's fulfillment number two, Titus chapter two. I love this one. This is the one I get crucified, or everybody gets crucified if you preach this much for. For the grace of God has appeared, has appeared that offers salvation to all people, teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in, his, in this present age. People say, well, Carlos, if you preach grace too hard, people are just going to continue to sin. Because when you preach grace, it gives people a license to sin. Uh -uh. It says that grace is God has come to offer salvation to all men to teach you to say no to sin. You have a perverted version of grace. And if you deny people of the hyper grace of God, the only grace that abounds and abounds and abounds and abounds and abounds and abounds and abounds, well, then you are actually restricting them from the essence that saves them because we believe we are saved by. Oh my gosh. So the more grace, the more saved you're going to look like. Grace is the only answer. Well, brother, my insurance guy told me that day because he's a Christian guy and he gives us insurance. He says, well, you know, that's a problem more ch most churches today, Carlos, you know, that um, we're just preaching too much grace. We should preach 90% law and 10% grace. <laughs> much like, read your Bible, man. You're not under the law anymore. You live under grace. Listen to this. It says, the law came through Moses and then grace and truth came through Jesus. So grace and truth came through M Jesus and Moses brought the law, well, then there's got to be lies in there. <laughs> Jesus didn't bring grace. He brought the truth about the law, the lies that we were endorsing. Okay, cool. So anyways, but in this present age, somebody say in this present age, the Advent's alive. Incarnation's alive. It's still got to be played out in your life. And the more you're tied into the tree, the more you'll produce fruit or it'll produce fruit for you. Next. Okay, so according to John, man, even in Revelation, oh my God, somebody say, oh no, don't go to Revelation. Even this confirms the whole Bible's an Advent unfolding story. And the dragon stood in front and pleased, that is metaphorical. 
And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. She gave birth to a son, capital S. Every all the prophecies, even John's having this freaking encounter and talking about what happened when Jesus came in the world. And she gave birth to a son, a male, who is going to rule all nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So the, the devil was doing everything. There's a lot more going on in Revelations, when, uh, in Re the book of Revelation, when the birth of Jesus came, when the incarnation was made real, that there was a fight and the devil was trying to rob Mary of the baby, but it didn't happen. God won. And it says, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So there was a lot more happening than just the people walking with lanterns giving them gifts. That's all good, but this whole story is about Advent. It's about confirming in Genesis chapter 3 that there was something wrong. And then there was even a war in heaven until that happened. Next. But the story begins when Jesus is a baby. The Bible is one big book of Advent. The Bible begins with Jesus being a baby, but that wasn't the end of the Advent. He still had to go do what he had to do in order to fight for you and me and win that victory on the cross. So this, next. So Advent was only the beginning of Jesus' victory. Him becoming a baby was only the beginning. And I celebrate that, that man, God, like we couldn't do it, so you came in the flesh, incarnate, to fight for us and as us. So this Advent season, it's got to look a little different. It's just not a time where we get around the Christmas tree and even ride on hay back singing Christmas carols. That's, I love all that. But dang it, the whole scripture is about Advent. It's the anticipation, the coming of one. And guess what? He came. And he's coming again. I don't know how or when. If I did, don't give me money if I ever predict that. Because it says that not even Jesus knew when he was coming. So if I ever give you a date about when Jesus is coming back, call me crazy. Be friends with me. Correct me politely, but I don't know. Don't give, that minist don't give ministries like that money, please. <laughs> Next, Advent. So Advent's great. Oh, so uh, I, Isaiah 55, I'm going to summarize it. You know, it's the one we... Um, Let's go to the next, next screen. Isaiah 55 is my favorite. This, like, reconciles everything for me. Like, this, the who, the what, the why, and everything, right? So in verse 8, we know the, the verse, you know, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You've heard that, right? And you've heard me preach that, right? You know, and we think it's like, oh, God's saying, <laughs> I'm so good. I'm too smart for you, you peasants. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As the heavens are so high, ah, you guys are just like little minions, right? And we think that. So when you read those three verses, it says that. You take that into context, right? You're like, oh, yeah, that's what it is. But you're getting conned because what it's really saying is that he's speaking to people in Israel. And he's been manifesting himself, self-revealing himself by fire by night, burning bush, healing them, taking them out of this, giving them different things, providing manna. He's been with them trying to reveal his goodness to them. And they're denying his goodness and they're believing lies about him when he's publicly published himself like that, right? And his complaint is not that, oh, he's bigger and you're this and all that. He's saying, you know, it hurts me that you don't have my same belief system. It hurts me that I'm trying to reveal myself to you and you've not adopted my belief system. It hurts me that my ways are higher than your ways. And the way you think is not like the way mine is. And then the Advent comes. And he reminds us of the incarnation and Advent language comes. So he says, since that's the case, and you guys aren't getting it, I'm going to have to do something. And let me remind you, because Moses, Genesis, Everybody's been talking about it. This is the message. He says this, for as the rain comes down, okay, so there's going to be movement. Something's going to come down, right? Comes down, and the snow from heaven, snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and, bre and bread to the eater. He's saying that something's got to happen because your belief system doesn't match mine. It hurts me so much that my ways are higher than your ways, that you are thinking inferior. You think your grasshopper is going into a promised land, and I've called you conquerors. I've called you promised landers. 
You know, you have come to a different conclusion than me. So I got to do something. I'm going to send something from down. And when it comes down like snow, it's going to melt there. It's going to water the earth. It's going to bring life. It's going to give bread to the eater. And then he says this, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. That's going to create life. And he says this, so shall the word be that goes from my mouth. Word, logos, Jesus, right? It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I had sent it. So he's saying something's got to change. And since you guys aren't getting my picture of who I am, I'm going to have to put on an earth suit. And you miss the burning bush, you miss the manna, all that kind of just short-lived itself. But I'm going to come in humanity itself to show you what God's like, me, me, the Father, me, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are like, but what you're really like too. And I'm going to come and publish that in mankind's sight. And whatever I touch is going to bring life. And God's saying, I'm going to do this. And Jesus will not return until the mission is accomplished. And what kind of mission is that? One that he pleases to accomplish. So he saves you from the tradition of the law and trying to work for great, uh, righteousness. Yes, but he saves you from a false belief system that he does not have. He comes, so Jesus actually repents for you and as you. And it shall prosper in, for the thing in which I sent it, and it shall accomplish what I please. So it's God's good pleasure to give you the reconciled belief system, the kingdom. It's God's good pleasure for you to sit here and just bask in the mercy and the grace that's pointed right at you. You guys are perfect landing strips for God's grace. And it was by nothing of your doing. But that's hell on earth for a lot of people. That's hell on earth for people who show up and need a score. That's hell on earth for people who try to earn and earn and earn everything. That when God's grace that is so free comes to your life and presents itself as free without transaction, it's so uncomfortable you run from it. So let's go to the next one. You guys, you guys all right? Okay, so the Advent season is light the candles. Let's do it. It brings peace, hope, joy, and love. Peace for mankind. Hope, not just for a future, but for already happen. Love, because it reveals the nature of God towards humanity while he was still yet a sinner. So the, the incarnation is still going on. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that when, when Jesus has done this, and the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. So that means even by Jesus doing it, he's trying to convince you that you've never been a part, that now God is all in all. Not just all in the church or all for the believers or all who are in this denomination. God is all in all. So you know what that means? That the Advent season was for you and then incarnation is all now. That's good news. <laughs> that Jesus Christ is inside of you, the incarnate one. So you are incarnation. He's moving through you. His incarnation, his incarnation is alive. The Advent season isn't just something that just happened and fizzled away in a past historic event. The birth of Jesus didn't stop happening. And nor is it ever because he's still alive. <laughs> Next. All in all. The sun is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God looks like? Jesus. He's the... Visible image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. The perfect example of humanity. For in him, all things were created. When you walk down the street and you see a cone in the middle of the street, see Christ in it. It doesn't mean it's God. I'm not talking about pantheism. I'm saying that God consists of all things, and all things are in Christ. When you see a beggar on the street, see Christ in him. If you don't see Christ in him, you ignore the Advent season and deny his incarnation in all. When you choose not to forgive, you deny the incarnation in all. Don't even celebrate Christmas then. When you don't give grace to yourself. When you receive condemnation for not hitting what people think should be a good mother. 
when you beat yourself up because you haven't produced enough. You are denying the Advent season. You are denying the incarnation. And it's not to make you guilty. It's to invite you into a reality that you did not create. So this holiday season, when you're opening presents, see the present in front of you. When you're shopping, rolling through the mall, buying something for your daughter, look at the lady in the cash register and see the incarnation in her. God's full plan is a revealing of his incarnation that the Advent season was always talking about. Advent, incarnation is a lot bigger than just December 25th. For in him all things were created. In him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Advent's a lot bigger than the four weeks anticipation for Christ's birth. Next. Is Ben in here? If we can get him in here, that would be awesome. Somebody can just go run and grab him. The incarnation can never be limited to a past event. Please understand that. Don't let Christmas end on December 25th, 1159, 59. Don't let the next time you want to give thanks for God come on Good Friday or during Lent or on Easter Sunday. Don't let the next time you get serious for God be on next Sunday. In fact, you know, being serious for God sucks. I've never been good at it. One time I was praying, I said, I'm going to wake up at 4.30 every day because that's what, I read a book and this guy woke up, woke up at 4.30 every day and prayed for in tongues for like seven hours or something. So I was like, well, I mean, that's the way to do it, right? So I picked up the book and I did that at 4.30 and like two weeks had passed and I'd been going at it for like three hours, not even seven, three, going and I'm miserable. No revelation, no download. And I tell God, you know what, man, I'm not enjoying this very much. And he goes, yeah, neither am I. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. <laughs> you know, um, you can't really be serious God for God in gospel context unless you understand how serious he is for you while you were still yet a sinner. You want to be serious for God? Take his, uh, his, his plan serious, and it'll create an amazingness in you to approach him with boldness in the throne of grace to receive what he has for you. Oh, you guys are right. I think I'm almost done. Let's go next. Okay, I already read this. Ephesians 2, 4. Man, like, ah, uh, how about this? I'm not going to command you to do something because it's called living in the flesh. Be pursued by God to unveil this in you. And when you're with your family for Christmas or whatever, when you're with your family ever, just take a time out and read this. This is the what of God. This is the plan of God. This is why the incarnation. This is why the death and resurrection. This is why he can be on the cross and get beaten. This is why he can be born as a baby. Um, withstand every temptation in the desert and do all those different things. This is why Jesus would come to his own and still love the people who don't recognize him. This is why he's still on the cross when he should, has every reason to say, you know what, they're not going to want me anyway. I'm going to get down. But he stays on there anyway. The why is this? He did all that for this. And just read it with your family and reflect on it. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he had for me, Carlos, even if I was the only person to exist in sin, that great measure of love would be just for me and it's just for you. Even when I was dead in my trespasses, when I had a different conclusion than him, 
when I didn't know the good news. He made me alive together with Christ by grace. I have been saved from my false reality. I've been saved from the performance to only provide what Jesus come. I've been saved from trying to be my own Lord and my own representation. And he's raising me up and giving me a better perspective, a heavenly perspective. <laughs> and he's made me sit. He's given me rest. You know why God has sits down on the Sabbath after he creates? Because he's convinced. He's concluded. He's not like, oh my God, they messed up. I got to get out of my throne and go do something. <laughs> he's not scrambling in heaven, drawing up charts with angels to make sure this thing works out. <laughs> the advent, the coming of Jesus as a baby, the incarnation was evidence just as much as the resurrection was. Why? Why? So that in the ages to come, that means today, tomorrow, the next second you breathe, 10 years from now when you have more kids, whenever you look in the future, and even tomorrow, consider that the, the immediate future. Why? Because in the ages to come, in the future, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards you in Christ. He did all this to be nice to you. <laughs> For the joy set before him. Forget go to the cross. He became a baby. For the joy set before him, he says, I'm going to redefine my wrath in the church now. And it doesn't look like me punishing people. It's like me punishing things that are hurting people. For it's by this grace that you will ever be saved, not just from heaven and hell, but from anything in your life. Anything that's creating distress, torment, you'll be saved from that. Not of your works, because if it was anything of your work, you'd be able to take credit for it. For you are his workmanship. That means he puts it together. That means he does the work. Have you ever tried to build something and just like stared at the Lego? And he didn't build it so... You needed to do that, but this isn't the case. God built it for you. But this is only so that you can walk in the revelation and do the good works that have been ordained for you. Next. So this is it right here. In this season, see Jesus anew. In this season, consider that the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, is much more than a necessary enfleshment as a prelude to a pagan blood sacrifice to appease the conflicted Godhead. Oh gosh. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the origin and the father of all. If you've seen Jesus, you have seen the spirit without measure. If any of this resonates and you start believing it, that's the spirit without measure. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen all men. Wow. You want to see Jesus? Look around. Not only is he in creation, he's all in all, it says. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the God who is a friend of sinners who became all sin for all of us to defeat sin itself. So Advent was just the beginning of the victory. Oh. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the sovereign, reconciling love of God on full display. <laughs> Think about that. When you see Jesus, you see God's yes to you. In the incarnation, God comes and gets on a knee in Christ, fully God, fully man, and says, will you marry me? And Jesus, as humanity, goes, yes, I will. Yes, I will. And he makes a response for you and as you. And when Adam couldn't say yes to you, 
Jesus Christ in his nativity and his coming in the in the in the preceding prophecies and the, the the building of scripture that announces this advent what it's really saying is it's God's unconditional yes to humanity and Christ while you were so yet a sinner took your spot and said yes for you and it doesn't eliminate liberty because there's no liberty outside of that yes if you've seen Jesus you have seen it begin and it finished in the Advent season. See Jesus. This doesn't mean, well, then what do I have to, why do I have to believe? No, this is why you can believe something. So you're saying, Carlos, we did all this, well, then why even have faith? Why believe? No, this is why you can believe something. Oh, God, thank you, Lord. Let's do communion. How about that? Release the children. You guys all right? Is anybody uh, happy for Advent season? Yes. No? Okay, good. Whatever. Who, who's hungry? I am. All right, cool. Well, uh, eat the bread in the body, my friend. <laughs> so we're into communion. This isn't a wonky thing that we do. Um, this isn't a ritualistic thing either. This is Advent. Yes, he's come and he's taking care of a lot of things and he is coming again, but this actually gives us priority. We can't be so hyped up about the next coming of Jesus that we forget to live according to the fruit of his first coming. <laughs> Don't celebrate the second coming so much that you forget what he has already paid for in his first one. And it came in the form of an eight pound, six ounce baby. Because let's do this. Uh, God, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness. Yes, Jesus, thank you. My gosh. Thank you very much. Let's get the. Rebecca, can you get the children out here? Just tell Beth, yeah. Like, I don't care. Um, you know, honestly, it doesn't take a lot to lead a church. I'm not up all night trying to do sermons and figure out how to fix the world. I mean, <laughs> it actually takes me 20 minutes to prepare for today. But I will say this, even that 20 minutes is not propelled because I want to lead a church because, man, I love Jesus. It's propelled because he first loved me. And anything I do, everything I say yes to is because of that. So they're probably finishing their project. Let's just take the, the body. So God, we thank you for the body that was broken. It wasn't for, broken for you, God. You didn't need the appeasement. We needed the peace. We needed to see something broken to see peace. So we thank you, Lord for your goodness and kindness and the body that was broken so we can be healed and we can hear your love for us. In Jesus' name. Thank you, God. And then Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. <laughs> that means that there's a new one. <laughs> And rather than call it the new covenant, it's just called the Christic covenant. Because sometimes when you call it the new covenant, you think, well, what do I got to do to uphold my end? But it's not the new covenant. It's the Christic covenant. The covenant between God and man and you're adopted into him. So we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you met our broken paradigms of the sacrificial system only to end it and show yourself as the eternal one. So we thank you for your body and blood, and we just drink that in Jesus' name.